and welcome to the Block Solid Podcast, where we talk about the evolution of the property market, the newest technologies that enhance and revolutionize the world of real estate as we know it, and how we, the owners, the buyers, the renters, the investors, the technologists, and the entrepreneurs can benefit from it all. I'm Yael Tamar, CEO and co-founder of Solid Block, pioneer in real estate tokenization, and I'd like to welcome my friend Richard Johnson to this podcast. Very excited to speak to you today, Richard. How are you doing? Hi, Yael. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. So Richard is the CEO of Texture Capital, a U.S. broker-dealer for revolutionizing issuance and trading of digital securities with blockchain and smart contract. And Richard here is at the forefront of transforming the market structure through security tokens. And I know you guys have been on this market since 2019. You know, we've been at it, you know, back and forth, kind of updating each other for a while. Uh, tell me what has changed since then? We're now four years into it. What do you see in the market now that you haven't seen in the beginning? Yeah, well, just to point out that of those four years, we did have to spend about two of them, the first 18 months of them getting licensed and regulated by the US uh, regulators, SEC and FINRA. So that's a, a, you know, a necessary uh, hurdle we all have to jump through because what we're doing is you know, we're, we, you know, we're much more regulated than traditional crypto markets, so we need to get the appropriate licenses to do these types of transactions. What we do is we help clients issue security tokens representing equity, debt, you know, royalties, revenue share, any type of real estate, and we have an ATS, Alternative Trading System, for secondary trading. Um, so what we've been doing in recently, so we've spoken a number of times, you said, about the real estate. It is one of the I'd say fastest moving segments within the whole tokenization space, but in fact, I know it's the fastest and, and the biggest. Um, but lots of other areas are, people are looking at as well, whether it's private credit, private equity. And what we decided to do about six months ago, six or seven months ago, is kind of open up our technology architectures, be very kind of uh, white labelable, um, open API access. So we're now offering that to any sponsor. Um, which could, you know, it could be Solar Block, it could be anyone else who wants to launch their own tokenized marketplace, uh -huh. where you can own the the user experience and the the, as, the expertise around the asset class, and we make sure everything stays compliant and do everything from the background, including kind of onboarding, KYC, AML, helping with the tokenization process, making sure we're doing all the right regulatory reporting and so forth. Um, so that's uh, we're excited about this new initiative because it allows us to kind of address. We're more focused, I guess, on on kind of digital securities market infrastructure. Uh -huh. and allows us to address all the different asset classes that are out there, which we feel are going to go on chain at some point. Very cool. Well, it's very exciting that you guys are, you know, have this technical backbone, and yet you also have all these complex licenses. So as far as I understand, the there is a special type of secondary market license that you guys had to get, right? Yeah, it's... Um... It's a little bit different in the US. You go in there with a the business plan and, and, and that's what the regulators basically need to approve as opposed to being you know, licensed A, B or C or whatever like that. But yeah, it, there's only about 10 or 11 of us in the US who have these specific digital securities licenses. Yeah. And why do you think that regulator is so specific about digital securities in this case? Like, is it more complex? Are the transactions more complex? Are they... Um, less understood, you know, why Why do you think that they need, needed to single out this aspect? Well, because of the, clo uh, the close proximity to crypto is the uh, obvious reason. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, since we started, I'd say the, I guess, regulatory friendliness towards the space, which wasn't particularly friendly at the beginning, has got a lot uh -huh. worse, a lot more hostile. Uh -huh. um, so we think it's you know, probably, you know, even hard, even when you're trying to do everything by the book like we are, um, it's got a lot, a lot hard. I mean, I'll tell you a little bit about our kind of genesis story. It was in 2018 when the ICOs were blowing up. Um, you may recall, or you may not, I don't know, Jay Clayton, who was the SEC chairman at the time, came out and said that every ICO is a security and these platforms need to be regulated. So that was kind of, you know, a light bulb moment and our call to arms. We've always been focused on doing things the right way, going in the front door mm -hmm. to the regulators, asking for permission, not forgiveness, and so forth. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, and I think there was a big turn last year with the FTX company, collapse that everything's kind of getting painted with the same brush or at least at least that's a, that's a concern that i have um it certainly seems that it, you know it, it's definitely more challenging even when you're doing yeah. everything the right way to prove that everything's everything's being done the right way oh for sure you know what's interesting to me um around that time i was working on as a marketing strategist on a couple of icos coming out of israel 
And, uh, you know, most of them actually have been kind of uh, big and successful. And, um, you know, as right as the market has cooled off for that, you know, I was doing these also these smaller podcasts or webcasts or whatever. And I remember specifically, and it's probably somewhere on YouTube, um, talking about back then how all the large exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken and all the rest have acquired companies that can facilitate secondary markets for securities. And at that point, it was still different uh, from what you're explaining right now, like in terms of digital securities or digital assets, uh, special purpose. But I noticed back then, and I kind of went through this registers of you know M and A and the, what what the, they acquired. And to me, it was a no brainer. Like, wow, well, they're gonna go into the space now because they most of them have the tools to actually provide secondary trading for securities. Um, and then they still didn't, and they you know now they're you know basically in, in this non-stop kind of quarrel with the back and forth with the SEC and they and it seems like they still choose not to adopt this compliance secondary market listing for securities do you have any words of wisdom like of what's going on and why uh, is it you know is it that complex complex or maybe they just want to um, do it differently access a different market segment or whatever yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's limitations to what we can do. So, for example, we can't trade, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, mm-hmm. um, or, in fact, we can't trade any other crypto assets, pure yeah. crypto assets, as it were, because mm-hmm. not only is there a requirement of the uh, intermediary, like Texture or one of these crypto exchanges, but there's a yeah. regulatory requirement for the issuers uh, to okay. either file a registration statement or use an exemption. Mm-hmm. And as these are kind of decentralized pro- projects without... You know, some, you know, this is you know, something you can argue about, but whether they they have a, you know, a management team or, or an issuer or a kind mm-hmm. of an even corporate structure, yeah. um, they, you know, typically they don't. They kind of crowdsource right. uh, uh, decentralized type products, and right. none of them are you know, you know. There's been some actions forcing some folks to register securities, but in general, none of them are, are treated as securities. So for that right. reason, we could hold them. And I think that's what people want a resolution to is they want to trade the assets yeah. like, you know, you know, you know, Solana, yeah. Ethereum, Maker, Compound, yeah. whatever. Um, well, those, maybe, for the most part, yeah. yeah, so for the most part, those, I, for most of them, there is kind of no argument right now whether or not they're securities. I mean, there's, of course, the big case of XRP, but then there are segments or of the market that they're using, which are securities like tokenized stocks and things like that, that they're still, you know, um, I, I would think that they could trade crypto and other things on their regular exchange with a regular license and then push something to something, even get, you know, extra capitals, um, white label solution, call it, you know, Coinbase powered by <laughs> extra capital and and okay, put those securities there, you know, do, do it that way. So I wonder why that's not happening. There's a huge opportunity there, Yale. Um, you look at, you know, you know, City came out recently saying that they expect four mm-hmm. to five trillion of assets to be tokenized by 2030. They call it the killer use case. Wow. Um, the uh, BCG and the World Economic Forum had mm-hmm. similar studies saying that it was a 16 or 17 trillion dollar business opportunity. Um, it's a ma- massive use case. My background before Texture was in traditional capital markets. Um, I'm a bit of a market structure nerd. I worked in a bunch of different trading desks. Um, you know, I know how markets work, and I spend a lot of my time in, in very liquid markets. Uh-huh. But there's all these other asset classes that aren't public U.S. equities that are much less liquid, and we can add a lot of benefit by yeah. using blockchain as the kind of the backbone of the new new, new market structure there. So all mm-hmm. these, kind of, you know, I think public equity will be the last to move on chain, but all the other asset classes will move on chain. There's a huge opportunity there just for the existing ones. And then I think there's also an opportunity for kind of, you know, developing new types of asset classes and making it more kind of accessible to everyday investors. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a fight being had over the, the regulatory status of crypto. But in the meantime, there's this huge opportunity that, like you said, a lot of the kind of incumbent crypt players should be looking at. Yeah, for sure. Like, it's, I think that a lot of times we're kind of engaged into this 
kind of back and forth and inside the inside the box and let's you know think outside the box how do we make it palatable because it's not only about kind of um putting regulators into their place which i you know i'm all for but on the other hand they do have a you know a function in a in a society um it's also about kind of making these products of, um accessible uh, to users that expect certain level of compliance. So on the one hand, there's retail users and, you know, maybe high net worth that normally don't have access to these institutional products that, you know, we make uh, available, all these great projects that they can invest in directly instead of, say, pu buy a public re, you know, a stock and, st and stuff like that. But on the other hand, there is a huge market of institutional buyers and uh, let's say Citibank's clients, you know, who are, who do they sell to? They have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, they have brokers that sell, I'm assuming broker dealers that sell to their clients, um, at family offices and small institutions and, and uh, pension funds and stuff like that. So they are not going to buy from a non-compliant or what's considered non-compliant resource. And so I think that you're onto something big, you know, and, and with them, um, with being able to distribute things compliantly to kind of these markets. Yeah, I think um, you know another thing. Is, another thing is when you look at again what's happened in crypto. Crypto volumes are down massively right now. Mm -hmm. A lot of people got burned. I mean, um, you know, a lot of people have lost money, frankly. And I guess there's a little bit of fun betting on kind of what's the next meme coin that looks like a dog or something like that for a while. Mm -hmm. But then that, that party is over right now. So the question is, are, are those retail investors who got brought into investing, uh, maybe some of them made some money, some of them lost some money. It's extremely volatile, obviously. But, you know, we're offering products that are, are, are more regulated, um, are, are often based, you know, backed by real world assets, have, you know, an income stream or, or, or some, some other kind of, you know, revenue model or whatever. And they're offering, you know, 10% returns or 10% yield or 15% returns, something like that, which is which would be great returns for a portfolio. Now, you're not going to get, you know, to the moon, 10,000x or whatever from mm -hmm. most security tokens out there. But, but um, you know, for most people, it's probably a better risk reward trade-off in their portfolio. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And of course, in order for us to get to the place where somebody will have a portfolio, there needs to be an availability of products and assets. Um, yep. So do you think that real estate is still going to be kind of the backbone or are we going to see a little more of this, a little more of that? And, you know, what is the perfect product to tokenize? No, the perfect product. I think it's pretty broad. I mean, we actually did a study recently looking at that. Um, and some of the things that are coming up is I think, you know, private, Private equity has got a lot of focus. I think that's going to be a tougher one. Um, you know, private company securities, definitely that's something we've, we've looked at. That's a huge space right now. Um, but also we're seeing, you know, with rates where they are, tokenized money market funds or, 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 or things like that, yielding assets yes. where you can, you can put your stable coins. I think mm -hmm. stable coins, you can have about 2% yield in some of the DeFi protocols. With the money market fund, you can have more like five. So, uh -huh. you know, you know, th that's a trend we're seeing right now as well. But really, oh. it, it runs the gamut, you know? Yeah. So you guys have an infrastructure to be able to incorporate some of that, you know, uh, either stable coins or protocols that do that or not? Uh, yes and no, I think. Yeah, we're looking to, a lot of times it's going to be up to the issuer because we're, we're not the issuer of the assets. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at ways that, you know, we've always looked at a lot of the innovation in DeFi and trying yeah. to bring it into kind of the regulated market sense. And mm -hmm. once you do that, it's not going to look exactly the same, but, you know, because there's other types of rules you need to follow. Yeah. yeah. We, we think we're going to be bringing to market a product fairly soon with very similar characteristics to a lot of what you see out there. It's but kind of, it kind of reminds me of these products that we saw at GBTC and uh, that are basically of funds or mutual funds or, or whatever they were that, that followed uh, or synthetic products that followed Bitcoin movement or funds, right? So it's kind of similar, but they're following a mutual fund or sorry, the, yeah, they're following basically a, some sort of a yield farming or um, stable coin fund that's giving 5% return. So that's kind of what you are. And then you guys are gonna, or they, the issuer is gonna earn on the spread. Right, so they're going to give 
It it's depends. It, it, yeah, it kind of depends. So, yeah, I mean, typically, you're right. Yes, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's kind of the other way around from the from the BTC products. The BT the, those like li exchange listed products for, for yeah. Bitcoin. They're basically doing it the other way around. They're taking a digital product, digital coin, yeah. and turning it into something that worked the old way. We're uh -huh. trying to do it the other way around. We're taking traditional assets and putting them on chain. Oh, so these are traditional funds that are giving five percent. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Okay, well that's easy enough uh, for people to understand, right? So uh, they're making them available because otherwise these are available only to ultra high net worth or institutions, and a very limited number of those, right? So and now you can actually buy a piece of that for, let's say, a thousand dollars or you know five grand, ten grand instead of. Millions, yeah. Right? Well, that depends. So, so, the, yeah. so, like I said, we're still following the regulations here. So, as a, yeah. so if you're following Reg D, that's yeah. an exemption you can use for um accredited investors. So, you still need yeah. to high net for that one. But yeah, sure. I think a lot more people using Reg A and Reg CF exemptions, um, which are both part of the I think it's 2014 uh, yeah. uh Jobs Act, the crowdfunding regulation around that. They allow retail investors to participate in private company, you know, private offerings or I guess they're kind of semi-private at this point. But yeah. that's, that's another very hot area we see, particularly around fractional marketplaces. Uh -huh. uh, where very you're cool. talking about get exposure for $500 or whatever it is. Yeah, that, exactly. So yeah, that's going to be super interesting, I think, in the future that, um, you know, there is definitely a trend that we see where individuals want to have control over their capital and uh, in the US you have definitely a lot more than in other countries where you can um, actually select kind of where your uh, 401k or mutual fund, uh, you know, pension fund money is going. And, um, you know, and if, interestingly enough, you can even put it towards invest similar investments such as these, right? And uh, so that's super exciting to me that, you know, individuals, especially those that are kind of skeptical about others um, and, you know, uh, others holding on and choosing, holding on to their assets and choosing the um, investment products and everybody kind of wants to go with their own ethics and their own taste in, in products and they're aware of management fees and inflation. It seems, to me, it seems like the new gener newer generations are kind of more aware uh, financial you know have higher financial IQ except you know of course the whole <laughs> the whole uh, cohort that you know went in and, and, and invested in everything in crypto and uh, um, or you know maybe maybe I'm wrong about that but anyway so what I'm what I'm getting at is it seems like you know now you guys and everybody else in the industry that caters to um, basically investors that are a little more aware than let's say the average investor on interactive brokers or on robin hood and um you know are maybe a little more looking into what kind of yields does the project offer like what is the product memorandum you know ppm what is the private place mem memorandum says and what is the data and things like that um do you do you think that that's the case kind of or you know how do you, how does the investor that goes on uh, some of your issuers uh platforms compared to an average let's say stock market investor I'd say to the average, probably a little bit more sophisticated because, um, you know, we, you know, you have to bear in mind that these are, you know, potentially more risky investments, even real estate. You know, you've got, kind of got to know a little bit about what you're doing. We wouldn't take on, for example, you know, if you've got a low risk tolerance or like a you know, you're a retired person or a modest pension or something like that, probably not the best thing to be investing in is kind of your know, complex real estate products or or, or private companies that, you know, you, you know, there's no, you know, you're better off maybe, you know, uh, one of those uh, uh, target date funds or something more stable. So I'd say in general, there, there is a slightly higher risk profile to what we're offering um, mm -hmm. than typical stock market investors, but at the same time, much lower than what's happening, you know, than, than the crypto market. So, you know, somewhat more sophisticated investor, I'd say. Yeah, very cool. So Richard, tell me what are you, what else are you guys planning that you might want to share and um, or just general about trends and really interesting things you see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me give you. I want to give you an example of one client we're working with right now to kind of show you kind of what we're doing with tokenization. Um, 
they offer a product called home equity investments. I'm not sure if you're familiar. You know, you know, I don't even have it in Israel. I don't know you don't have it in m- many parts of Europe. We kind of, so, I mean, home equity investment, um, it's, it's, yeah, we do have. We, we have, it was super popular. There were so many, you know, so many funds that used to deal with that. Um, but in Israel, in fact, a lot of people, um, you know, have mortgage and they refinance. So they kind of never almost have a situation where, they've paid off their home, <laughs> but uh, um, well, some do, yeah. Well, let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. It's, it's similar, yeah. but you can still have a mortgage. Let's say somebody has a million yeah. dollar home with a $500,000 mortgage or something. Yeah. Um, they could still sell $100,000 of that excess equity. And right. and, and, and uh-huh. in this kind of high rate environment, that may be preferable to a HELOC. So yeah. this, this kind of space is fairly new, less than 10 years old. Uh, but it's been very institutional right now, very much an institutional market. And what we're doing with this other company is working to kind of fractionalize and tokenize these investments. They're going to be offering them to a reggae offering to retail investors. And mm-hmm. we were able to do this with the blockchain technology underpinning it all. So I think it's a great example of how we're using the technology and you know our, our, our ATS and, and, and our regulatory license and so forth to help bring this, what mm-hmm. was an institutional product, to a more retail market. Got it. That's really cool. So, um, is this this is a structured product consisting of home equity loans, or is this actually somebody offering service to homeowners to to get to get them? Uh, well, so the, 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 the company is doing both. We're doing just the kind of investment side, but it's individual homes. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, you can look about by zip code, for example, as opposed to a portfolio, which is another kind of. I guess advantage of doing going through the fractionalized route is that you can build your own portfolio as opposed to having somebody else just you know build a pool for you. I love it. And are these rated? No. Mm, okay. Um, okay. They these some products in the space are rated, but I don't mm. I don't have the I don't have the details of that in front of me right now though. Cool. Oh, this is really interesting. Yeah, we've thought about the home equity. Yeah, you're right. You could put you could have a primary lender and then still um you know um yeah. assign or sell a part of your equities uh, economic interests to um to another institution yeah and we we have quite a few here here in israel that do that um and it's it's brilliant you know almost everybody uh wants to um uh wants to have uh their home leverage to the max so um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's in Israel, at least, because here we have like some of the highest concentration of of loans per person of all kinds. Um, so, so yeah, this this is really cool, and I, I think that tokenization does offer a lot of um, new models, like you said, and um, new possibilities in the market. And we can only imagine what they're going to be. So, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys are up to and uh, catching up with you every once in a while. Um, to hear some interesting use cases. Yeah, absolutely. Keep keeping in touch here. Right. Awesome, Richard. Really, really uh, happy to have you here. And um, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or by visiting the website at salva.co slash podcast. Check out Texture Capital. 